Hello and welcome to Invisible Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. This is a show about London and community and addiction and substance use and all the things involved in that and how it impacts our community and the people in it. Today we have someone on the show that he doesn't know it, but I've been chasing him around for a couple of years trying to, to get, get so I can spend some time with uh, Dr. Martin Judson. Uh, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for the invitation. Pleased That's to be here. My pleasure. Uh, people in my circle, your name rings throughout the hallways uh, because you have been a doctor working in the field of addiction in the city of London for... 40 years. 40 years. So we would love to just talk today more about what you've seen and what you've reflected on and all that. We've been, we we're having some conversations before the camera turned on and we could dive into these conversations all day, but there's so much uh, wisdom and knowledge and experience that we just want to tap in today and, uh, and get to know some more about that. First off, um, the Caduceus group. I would love to know more about that. The uh, Caduceus group is a, a support group uh, for recovering uh, physicians who have a problem with the substance misuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has in actual fact expanded the one that we conduct in London to become a health professionals group. So the doors have opened to accommodate uh, nurses and physiotherapists and counselors, anybody who is uh, registered or has a, a license to practice. Uh, but it's been operating since the early 90s and probably there have been over 400 members of this support group who have sort of been entitled to join and some uh, come for a few sessions and others have remained in contact and have participated on a weekly basis for nearly 30 years. Wow. And it's uh, amazing to see the, uh, the growth in the in the participants' uh, recovery and uh, how well they operate uh, now in comparison with sort of 30 years ago. Wow, there's um, uh, um, a misnomer, there's this idea, and we talked about this earlier, there's a stigma in today's society that we think that the people with addiction issues are all, you know, of the homeless population or a certain type of demograph of people. And we can recognize what you just said was these are doctors and professionals and these are people that, you know, that are your neighbors and, uh, you know, the people that live that are close to us. Oh, very much so. Uh, I mean, addiction is not just a sort of a, a problem, a reflection of the ails of a society and poor coping strategies, it's also considered to be a, a disease. And one of the criteria for uh, classifying something as a disease is that it's uh, uh, something that anybody can contract, as it were. Anybody can develop cancer, anybody can develop pneumonia, and anybody can develop uh, substance misuse, which goes on into addiction, if all the other factors are right. So that uh, means that doctors certainly um, are subject to uh, uh, suffering from substance misuse. And indeed, uh, it's probably around about uh, five to six percent of f uh, physicians will at some stage uh, of their careers uh, have a problem with substance misuse to some degree. It may even ex extend to the situation where they are no longer capable of working and they have to take time off for formal treatment and be monitored very, very rigorously uh, to make sure that they're safe to return to the practice of medicine. So when we're looking at that, we can see that people that have high status jobs or people that have potential to cause harm usually have more standards in place when they recognize there's an addiction there. Is, is this a mandated program or these things that they have to do as, you know, as a result of maintaining their licensing or maintaining their, um, yes. their, their standing with the governing body? Yeah, the governing body is in Ontario is the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and there are two ways in which the college could be uh, in, notified and that is by a self-report by a physician who on their application for renewal of their license will have to answer certain questions and one of them is to disclose whether they have a medical condition which may compromise their ability to safely practice medicine. That's one way in which the regulatory body will be uh, informed. On the other hand the college may be informed by other agencies or um, uh, may be reported by uh, by someone, and in which case the uh, college has to investigate, uh, and they're in usually encouraged to contact the physician health program, which is operated by the Ontario Medical Association, 
and has been in operation since about 1993. And the recommendation is that uh, for uh, physicians to really take some time off to see what is necessary for their, uh, their, their treatment program, and that might entail uh, just some uh, counseling. On the other hand, if the disease of addiction has progressed, then invariably the physician has to take time off to uh, enroll in a formal residential treatment program. And once they've completed that, which may last 30, 60 days, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're well enough to go back to work. The program of recovery is just really beginning, and then they have to sort of engage in community support networks such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, see counselors and therapists, and all the while they're being monitored by their addictionist, uh, such as myself, or they may be uh, uh, seeing uh, counselors from uh, other agencies, and reports have to be sent into the physician health program uh, that collates all this information and then can then uh, make a recommendation to uh, whether the uh, physician is fit to return to the practice of medicine. And if that's the case, the College of Physicians and Surgeons gets notified. But it, it's not unusual for physicians to be off work for a year, 18 months, two years, and maybe even longer in, in the cases of some other professionals. I've had some nurses who've been off work for four years, but I can assure you when they do return to work, they're the healthiest people that I've, I've come across, and it's a joy to work with them. Mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure of working with some myself, and I can see that there's uh, very unique hurdles uh, that physicians have to overcome. And you can see maybe some of the people watching the episode and being like, oh, the poor doctor, you know, he's got he's to take care of his stuff. When people, you know, they they hold a stigma towards people uh, that might have money or have a good job and be like, oh, they, they're okay, they, got, they can take care of it. But there's a unique set of hurdles for every single individual. Can you share a little bit about what some of those unique hurdles for somebody working in the medical I think the field one, might be? The one that stands out the most is that physicians and uh, nurses and really any health professional is really expected to put others before self. And as a result, mm -hmm. they're at risk of burnout and uh, uh, overwork and stress. And as a result, that can cause uh, physicians to find that they become overwhelmed by their work and resort to substances as, as a way of coping. And that, can, uh, that use of substances can surreptitiously very subtly creep up on the individual to the point that they don't realize they've had a problem until it's almost become too late, that they will show up for work on the ward or into the operating room and they're smelling of, of alcohol or their hands are shaking. Um, and so um, the, the main thing that they need to uh, understand is that uh, or physicians need to understand, and nurses too, that they are human and they're entitled to their emotions, they're entitled to anxiety, and the best way to deal with this is to talk it through rather than sort of self-medicating with substances. But the shame and the stigma that's associated with addiction is even magnified in the case of the helping professions. Right. That uh, physicians will sort of uh, retreat into their sort of, uh, uh, their, their ever diminishing world uh, and they only have a relationship not so much with people outside but their, their relationship with the drugs or the bottle and so uh, matters can deteriorate very quickly it's very hard for a physician to come forward for, for treatment but once they realize that there is no alternative because they've got so much to lose if they don't seek treatment once they do en enter treatment they do very well in fact the recovery rate for in the general population for uh, people who suffer from substance misuse is around about 29 to 35 percent, depending on what sort of uh, s surveys you've you've studied. But in the case of physicians, it's uh, well into the high 80s or uh, low 90s percent of those suffering with addiction return to work. So, um, because they they're motivated, and they said they have something to 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 lose if they if they don't get healthy but there's a lot of support out there. They've just got to tap into it, just as anybody does. Mm -hmm. Society is replete with support networks, but people are ashamed and embarrassed to come forward for, for treatment. Mm -hmm. But uh, by latching into support networks, they learn that there's no reason to be ashamed, they're not alone, there's hope, and they can get better, and indeed they do. I love it. The, uh, this is the, the, the crux of it all, regardless of whether 
it's homelessness or all the way up to being a physician or being somebody you know held in, in high regard in, in society that the shame and the stigma is the barrier it's the you know if I can't get past the idea that there's something wrong with me I'll never be able to actually reflect inward to make those changes and what, what I just heard you say was that you know once they get past that idea of I can be open I can take ownership I can reflect and get healthy they turn into quite studious um, individuals who want to learn and, and grow and they, they heal really fast. Uh, yes, that, that's the case. Uh, but if, you, if you're not well, willing to sort of, uh, or appreciate the need to open up and connect, then uh, uh, you're, you're not going to get healthy. But uh, the, it's just making that, or having someone say the right thing at the right time uh, to the individual who's sensitized to their substance misuse can make all the difference. Mm. But um, even though I'm a practicing physician, I, I recognize that uh, addiction is not just a disease. It's a very rich condition. Mm. It can be a learned pattern of behavior. It's a reflection of poor coping strategies. It's mm -hmm. a reflection of the, all the ills of, of society. But one good thing about viewing addiction as a disease uh, will uh, allow physicians and any member of society to appreciate that treatment is available. There's no cure for addiction, but there, at least there's, there's, uh, there is treatment. I mean, diabetes can't be cured, hypertension can't be cured, renal disease can't be cured, but it can certainly be managed. And so too can addiction be managed. And everybody's entitled to good health. And there's no reason why someone who suffers from addiction, particularly a physician or a healthcare professional, can't uh, be, uh, can't access that uh, treatment. The very first thing I heard you say, and it stuck right in my right in my brain in that moment, was it. It only takes somebody to hear the one right thing, the one thing that stands out to them that helps them to move forward and to change. And I see so much value in that every single day. And as part of why we do the show today, because we're hoping that every person will maybe hear that one thing, right? Yes, some people probably been tuning into your show for, for several years and uh, they're still flailing around and not making any yeah. progress. But that hasn't been wasted because that sort of set the scene and mm. sort of loading up the evidence that they need to do something. And then ev eventually uh, something will be said and it might be something that you say today and that's the final straw or the, 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 the penny drops and the light goes on and the individual then realizes that it's not wrong to pick up that phone and just ask for help because the antidote for addiction is connection and that's why things have been so difficult for people in need of treatment in the last two years because we've had to practice medicine online and uh, that is the worst thing possible so the, the fact that our caduceus group is now able to go back into a meeting room uh, is made uh, life and recovery programs for so many healthcare professionals that much richer and better and it's given them a new lease on life. Mm -hmm. Fantastic and that's a great segue because I want to talk more about all those things that you just talked about about all the complexes we're going to switch topics we're going to take a quick break and after this break we'll have more of uh, Dr. Martin Judson we're going to talk about uh, some more complexities of society and how uh, addiction is impacting the city. Welcome back to Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction, where we have Dr. Martin Judson on the show, and we're going to jump right into it. And I know that your experiences as a doctor over the years had a lot to do with opioid uh, treatment therapy, and I want to dive right into your reflections and what that's looked like over the last 40 years and where we're at now with it, because we all know this is the big hot topic uh, right around uh, the city and across, well, around the globe um, of opioid replacement and or fentanyl and the overdoses and all that and it's just a, a big focal point and part of the reason why I want to tap into your expertise and your knowledge so badly is because I know that you got a lot to say about it. Well, I've been uh, prescribing uh, opioid replacement therapy and I prefer that term replacement, not substitution because to say uh, I'm providing substitution therapy implies that I'm a legalized drug dealer. I'm not. I'm prescribing a medication, methadone or suboxone, which replaces the, some of those 
effectively th those neurochemicals in the brain which years and years of opioid misuse have uh, reduced mm -hmm. and so patients uh, feel um, in withdrawal if they don't get their opioids but I started replacement therapy in 1993 when I was still in general practice in northwest London and uh, I'd been contacted by the then Addiction Research Foundation which is now the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. They had a patient who was moving from Toronto and was prescribed methadone which in those days was still of in the experimental and research stages here in Canada and they asked if I would assume care for this gentleman. I was a bit hesitant at first because I was concentrating my practice on alcoholics uh, but I agreed and uh, within uh, two or three uh, weeks of that individual coming to my private office in White Hills uh, uh, he sent along a couple of his colleagues and then the numbers just went up every week and it just got so big and my interest in addiction was growing that I uh, eventually left and opened up my own office uh, and soon my quota as it was uh, called in those days because the College of Physicians and Surgeons stipulated the maximum number of patients that any doctor could have who was being prescribed who been being prescribed methadone. In those days it was tapped it to 60. Um, and so I had my full complement and then had to recruit other physicians to take on the workload and we grew and grew and uh, went into larger premises eventually and, and then eventually opened up clinic 528 on Dundas Street. Mm -hmm. And we were the only methadone replacement clinic in southwestern Ontario at that time in, in the early 2000s. And, uh, since then it's it's grown and uh, it was tightly regulated by the college as I was sort of alluding to before and that was in some ways good because it kept the standards high but now uh, because addiction is being the subject which is being talked about and it's sort of chic to be involved in the treatment of addiction unfortunately there are a lot of people professionals and lay people who are purport to be an addiction specialist and unfortunately don't really know what they're doing and they're prescribing far too many inappropriate medications and uh, that in my opinion includes what we call safe supply uh, programs. They're not safe, they're really relatively unsafe but it's, uh, it's all in response to the Ministry of Health wanting it all uh, levels to try and minimize the use of this dreaded drug fentanyl most of which is street fentanyl it's not made in a pharmaceutical laboratory but it's manufactured in clandestine laboratories and it's contaminated with other drugs such as benzodiazepines and xylazine and so on uh, and analogs of uh, fentanyl which are, are, are lethal and uh, that I feel in many ways that the prescribing of opioids has gone beyond uh, prescribing just methadone in form of replacement therapy which was tightly monitored uh, to prescribing all sorts of opioids which are just aggravating the problem and causing more harm to society than it intended to relieve. I, I need to know more. In what ways do you think that it's causing more harm specifically? Well, I harp back to uh, uh, a, a professor at the University of Western Ontario, as it was named in those days, uh, Dr. Paul Whitehead. He'd just published a paper when I first came to London in the mid-70s and he had studied alcoholism and alcoholics and his conclusion in the synopsis was that the more alcohol that is available the more alcohol will be consumed the more alcohol that is consumed the more problems will develop and uh, that stuck with me ever since and uh, uh, it was about nine months after that paper was published in the medical literature or the psychology literature that the Ontario government then legalized the sale of alcohol in variety stores and in grocery stores and it was about so two or three years after that that we saw an uptake in the amount of alcohol abuse amongst younger people so I mean Paul Whitehead was way ahead of his time mm -hmm. and I've just used that as an example to just, just transfer that or extrapolate it to the use of opioids that the more opioids that are available prescribed or otherwise the more opioids will be used and of course the greater the risk of problems being caused by uh, by opioids but there's been this push for harm reduction at all costs. Harm reduction is a term I don't really like. I much prefer use minimization because that includes and encompasses harm reduction mm -hmm. but it 
really means that, that it's going to be better for society in general and for the individual if they use less. But many of these safe, uh, su supposedly safe supply clinics, which are springing up all over London, uh, are prescribing what was called a uh, pharmaceutical dilaudid, which is short-acting and has strong euphoriogenic properties. So patients will be monitored for one or two of these doses in the pharmacy, but then they're given enough of this medication to take home. They don't take it all. They use it to either uh, uh, sell for fentanyl, on which they then later overdose, or they will use it to purchase other drugs, or they'll just give it away, or they'll just spend that money on other things and food. And um, it, it's now become so uh, prevalent, that, and it's well known in London that these clinics are available, that people are even moving into town, and in a small way, contributing to our homeless population. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems trendy, it seems appropriate, it seems uh, the correct uh, thing to do is to give people what they want. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with addiction, the disease of addiction distorts all the cognitive processes uh, and it met, renders the individual who suffers with the addiction unable to determine what is healthy and what is not. In fact, they become too sick to realize how sick they are mm -hmm. and to know that it's dangerous to keep on taking opioids. And if they are given a sort of readily available supply of opioids without any strings attached, there's no uh, impetus for them to have to, to change. But as we were saying earlier, in the case of physicians, they have, they have to get healthy if they want to continue practicing. And they pay a price, and that price is they have to be totally abstinent. A physician can't even look at an antihistamine mm. and then expect to be able to continue to, mm -hmm. to, to go back to practice because they're subjected to hair testing, urine testing, and if any drug shows up, they can't practice. Mm. But in the case of people who are being given uh, medications on a supposed harm reduction program, there, there's nothing expected in return. And I think that's not good for somebody. If they want, to, we know that, um, there's no one single cause for ad uh, of addiction, but there are many contributing factors for addiction. And similarly, uh, in recovery, there's no single cure. And handing out opioids indiscriminately without full assessments, and when it's not safe and not cautious, uh, is not the answer. There are many things that are required for someone to get healthy from addiction, and that is that they have to have hope I alluded to earlier, and they have to be responsible and they have to connect. Those are the main antidotes to addiction. Mm -hmm. Addiction is often referred to as the disease of isolation and chaos, but recovery is responsibility and connectedness. Mm -hmm. So as we said earlier, people have got to connect. Everybody's got to connect. That's why the pandemic was disastrous for, for uh, addicted people. But now they can connect eye contact, not contact with a screen, but as we are right now, mm -hmm. eyeball to eyeball mm -hmm. is essential to feel that aura around you, to get that spiritual connection. There's no spiritual connection between people connecting online. That is, th mm. that's just not the case at mm. all. So you need connectedness, you need to become responsible. And to be given drugs with no strings attached doesn't help people, it's demeaning, it's demoralizing. Mm. People should really have the approach of carrot and stick, as I call it. They're given the carrot of the of the opioid, but in return, what can that individual do for society? It mm -hmm. may be something fairly straightforward, but they can volunteer in certain places, but people need to feel needed, they need to feel wanted, they need, but lo and behold, they want to give something back. I've seen numerous people in the clinics who are uh, on opioid replacement clinic, uh, opioid replacement therapy, they're homeless, but uh, when you strip that aside and you get to know them, there's humanity inside that person and you can tell that they are grateful if they can feel that they can be of value to somebody else mm -hmm. in recovery. And so there the needs to be something expected of someone who accesses a safe supply or expected of someone who comes to the methadone clinic. We encourage people to participate in in therapy, in counseling, but unfortunately few do. But those that do, they stand out a mile. 
they, they, they're the ones that are going to get better. And they're the ones that are going to be able to contribute more to society. They're going to feel better about themselves, and then nothing succeeds like success. I've witnessed it. I know it. Mm -hmm. But these programs where unregulated people are giving out what patients want as opposed to what they need are, in my opinion, contributing to the problem they're trying to solve. That was a lot, um, and I hear it. Uh, I recognize it, and so many things stand out as true in those uh, in those moments. And looking at uh, individuals wanting to make change, one of the things that I look at as an addiction counselor is I'm constantly looking at the you know the fear of change being greater than the pain of staying the same. And there has to be this tilting point that says, I can see, I can see, and this is where you talked about hope and direction and something that's going to push me in that direction. So what you're saying is, is that when they're given it freely and they just contribute, then they they don't have that desire to change. There's no catalyst for them to find enough discomfort to search for something better. No, it's just a question of all they have to do is take this drug and then come back again and get some more drugs. Mm. But there's no, uh, the idea of attending support groups or counseling mm -hmm. is given lip service. Uh, and it said, well, you know, you're encouraged to go, but people still say, I'll, I'll go maybe tomorrow. But mm -hmm. tomorrow, of course, never comes because right. tomorrow is today when right. it comes. And, and so people don't change. But it, there, there needs to be a little bit more coercive leverage. Yeah. But in today's society, which has become far too permissive, far too undisciplined, that it's considered um, wrong that people should be coerced into doing anything. Mm -hmm. As I alluded to earlier, maybe it's never been explained to them that there is a lot more to recovery than just taking pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And I've been saying that for a long time, that the prescription of the methadone, and now the case of Dilaudid and other opioids, that is a small part. The government and Ministry of Health seems to be obsessed with giving patients what they need, giving, I call them symptom chasers, trying to alleviate every possible symptom of anxiety, every possible symptom of withdrawal. Give them those drugs, give them the, what, they, what they think they, they want uh, without really showing them that there is a multitude of other things that will do them far more good. It will help them to uh, change their attitude, give them hope uh, through talking to other people. They gain insight into their condition. They start to develop meaning. They realize that what they're doing is enhancing their self-esteem mm -hmm. and they have support from other people. Those are all the requirements for recovery. Those requirements don't come in dilaudid tablets mm -hmm. and tablets which are supposedly replacing the need to use fentanyl. No, the patient, patients are not using less fentanyl. They're using fentanyl and more yeah. dilaudid. And they may even also be on methadone, which we don't, and we don't pick up their drug use when they come to the clinic because we, we can't screen for every single drug that's out there on yeah. the street. It's getting worse, but it's, I have faith that things go in cycles, mm -hmm. that uh, we had this problem back in the 90s and when I started prescribing methadone, it was to curb the, the abuse of Percocet. And then we dealt with that, and then we had to deal with the problem with OxyContin, and that was dealt with, and then it came with uh, 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 fentanyl creeping onto the, uh, onto the, into the situation, and many doctors prescribing vast amounts of opioids for the management of a supposed uh, chronic non-malignant pain. I've been in general practice for long years before I started uh, addiction medicine, and I was aware that there is really no non-cancerous condition that requires long-term use of opioids. Mm -hmm. Many people who supposedly suffer from uh, chronic pain in their own mind are in actual fact, in my opinion, undiagnosed addicted people, <laughs> and that needs to yes, be confronted. I, yeah, I agree. I I'm not that. saying that there aren't some people, yeah. but there aren't as many as we would be led to believe mm -hmm. based on patients' complaints. Mm -hmm. They're in pain, yes, but it's psychological, emotional, and spiritual pain that they're mm -hmm. suffering from, and that just shouldn't deny them treatment, but we're focusing on the physical pain, so we've been prescribing too many opioids, and so opioids are becoming a way of managing everything. And now we're trying to deal with a problem which the, which the 
medical profession in part created, societies endorsing, politicians and uh, policy makers are encouraging. We're just going down the wrong path, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But the pendulum will swing back the other way. I, I, I agree. I have so many more questions. Unfortunately, we, we've run out of time, so we're going to have to... I, I, I see the value in... in in, in what can be done, and I would love to talk more about what some of the solutions that you may think there are, but unfortunately we're out of time. I see that we're talking very clearly about um, a, a biological cure to a mental, emotional, spiritual, uh, social problem. You've summed it up perfectly. And, and we need to put more emphasis and energy on those other parts. Absolutely. So, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. And thanks for watching Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction.